Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, a free site, bettingangle.us, a free site. It is July 14th, 2024. Let's talk boxing. Let's talk 147 pounds. Let's talk Jaron Ennis's win over David Avenissian. But first, remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, I believe this fight is a referential fight. I believe uh, a lot of people have heard about Jaron Ennis. They understood that David Avenissian is a tough opponent. They understood that Jaron Ennis had been out of the ring for a while, that this was a homecoming fight. Understand, it's hard to find a tougher crowd in the United States than Philadelphia, especially when you're talking about boxing. Right now, just a few observations here. Let me just say, this is a major fight. In my favorites folder right now, I have the highlights of this fight. Um, what I want people to notice, and it's very important here, is that the referee is excellent. This is the ref who should be doing Tyson Fury fights. In other words, the ref is not allowing a lot here. He's letting the fighters know, don't do that, right? And he's doing it from a position where he's not showing up the fighter, but he's not letting guys get away with using an arm as a range finder. Lord knows, Jaron Ennis tries to do that, right? But understand, he's not allowing the guys to cut corners. And still, in this fight, Jaron Ennis looks magnificent. Right, folks, there's no one close to him right now at 147 pounds. Right, not only is there no one close to him, there's no one below him who can really challenge him. Let's talk about my observations about this fight. First off, I'm shocked. That 5'10", let's remember that, 5'10", Jaron Ennis is able to make weight at 147. Right, folks, he and Avenesian look like they belong in different weight classes. He's much taller than Avenesian. Right, understand, too, it's even freakier than that. At the weigh-in, Avenesian weighed more than him. Avenesian barely makes weight. Jaron Ennis is several ounces below 147 pounds. Now, what I want people to do is to look at the frame on the guy. It's my belief he only has one or two more fights at 147 pounds. He's going to be in the mix at 154. What I also want people to do is to realize at 154, Crawford is at least eight years older than Jaron Ennis. Understand, Jamel Charlo is also in his 30s. Father Time waits for no one. You have Tim Zhu. You have Virgil Ortiz. When you think about the Jaron Ennis story, you're really going to have to start thinking about the guys at 154 pounds. Right? Erickson Lubin. I wonder how that fight would go. Jaron Ennis against Sebastian Fundora. Those are the names you should think about. Let me make a few other points, too. Ryan Garcia, I know he supposedly fought Devin Haney at 140. Well, he himself weighed 143 and a half. Right now, let's be clear. He's suspended, but you and I understand the suspension uh, is only for a year, and he was already several months into that year when it got released. Right now, who knows what weight Ryan Garcia is going to come back at? I don't think it's going to be 140 pounds. Folks, Garcia, like Jaron Ennis, has a big frame. Right? I'm guessing 154 or 160 is going to be a lot more crowded than you think it should be. Well, this guy, who just fought at 147, is going to be a player at 154. I don't think he ever fights Terrence Crawford. I think Crawford 
is aiming for Canelo. Crawford has money in the bank. Crawford's at an age where it's all about legacy for him. He wants to retire unbeaten. He's fighting with Dream Off. There's an outcry for Crawford. Canelo, if not Canelo, there are several other names who Crawford could fight against whom he would have a decided advantage. He would not have a decided advantage, in my opinion, against Jaron Ennis. The first round is a jaw dropper. Ennis comes out. Ennis has fast hands. Ennis is throwing a jab. Now, on the telecast, Sergio Mora calls it a power jab. Right, folks? Very few people in boxing have power jabs. Right? Virgil Ortiz has a power jab. By a power jab, we're talking about a punch that looks like a jab. But it's actually a power punch. Now, Avanesian is your grizzled veteran. Mid-30s. Has been in wars. Right? Just to understand, in the first round, Avanesian looks stunned by a Jaron Ennis jab. Right, folks, you, you see the jab and you realize this is a major weapon. Let me say, too, that Avanesian recovers. He then starts landing shots. Now, here's the question, and it's an unanswered one after this fight. Avanesian starts landing head shots, including Avanesian right-handed, straight right hands to Ennis's head. Ennis who I've seen moving around in other fights. Here is tethered to the pocket, and he gets hit with the shots. Right, looking at this fight, I did not get the impression that Jared Ennis was on the top of his game defensively. Now the question is, because Ennis has been inactive, is Ennis's defense slipping? Or was he tethered to the pocket because he saw what we all saw? An opponent who got straightened up a bit by Ennis's jab. And maybe Ennis, who has ended some fights early. Look at Ennis's KO percentage also. He's really a knockout puncher. Did Ennis decide to give up on movement so he could try to go for the knockout? Well, what I saw was Avanesian actually landing enough punches where, believe it or not, the guys on the telecast started saying that Avanesian was doing better than they thought he would. Now, there was a guy on the telecast, I think it's Sean Porter, who said, well, I wasn't sure if he was going to come and lay down. <laughs> right? Some of the guys on the telecast had lower expectations than others. Right? But I thought Avanesian came to win. I thought Avanesian's basic premise was, this is a war of attrition. If I hang around and throw enough power shots on this guy, right, maybe the moment's going to be too big for him. Maybe I can wilt this guy through perseverance. I don't have to have his hand speed. I don't have to be anywhere other than in front of his home crowd, if I just take the guy's shots and I hang around the pocket and land my own, sooner or later this guy's going to realize he doesn't have the edge on me. Sooner or later this guy who's been more inactive than me lately is going to wilt. But then we get the dynamic that's a showstopper. 5'10", Jaron Ennis starts targeting Avanesian's body. Right now, you've heard me talk about blueprints. Understand, Terence Crawford, when he beat Avanesian, he targeted Avanesian's body. On Gambler's Advisory right now, by chance, I have a highlight reel of that Crawford-Avanesian fight that focuses on Crawford's body shots. But here it's interesting, because understand, Jaron Ennis is bigger than Terrence Crawford. He's 5'10". 
And you wonder, okay, wow, he's been hit in the head with a few shots from Avenesia. Is he going to make the commitment needed to hang in the pocket, to stay close to Avenesian, to go to his body? And folks, that's the story of this fight. It's a two-handed attack to Avenesian's body by a taller man. These are the things that we all need to make a note of. Right, Jaron Ennis is brutal to a guy's body. And he can set it up so he doesn't get hit that much. I was impressed. He starts belting away on Avenesian's body like Crawford. And you can tell the fighters who study film. Like Crawford. It's as if Jaron Ennis just took out that Crawford film and studied it. Ennis starts throwing uppercuts off the body shots. You notice Avenesian's face start to swell. Then we get to an interesting round, the fourth round. Now I consider Errol Spence to have been at his absolute best for his fight against your Dennis Ugas, who had just beaten Manny Pacquiao. Now, styles make fights. Ugas is a negative energy guy, kind of like Shakur Stevenson. Stevenson's faster, don't get me wrong. But Jaron Ennis is a defensive, excuse me, you Dennis is a defensive wizard who wants to force you to lead, and then he beats you off the counters. So how Errol Spence beat him was Errol Spence drapes himself on Ennis, smothers the situation. So Ennis doesn't have clear countering opportunities. And then Spence, while pivoting around the pocket, while literally draped on you, Dennis, right? You've heard me use the phrase short-range hooker. Right, Spence is up on him, and Spence is able to move and land powerful shots on him. That's the dynamic you get here in the fourth round of this Jaron Ennis fight. Ennis drapes himself on Avenician, a dangerous opponent who himself wants to be in the pocket, but who doesn't want to be as in the pocket as up close and personal as Jaron Ennis is able to operate. Right? The footage of the fourth round tells me that Shakur Stevenson, who I think should leave 135, should go to other weight classes, should fight front foot heavy opponents because I think his hand speed and his defense would rule the day. I think he'd be a more exciting fighter, quite frankly, if he fights, you know, a Ramirez at 140 or a Teofimo Lopez, right? You know, because I believe an opponent can carry the fight, we would then notice the defense, right? No one faults Ali for his negative energy against Sonny Liston because Liston's coming forward. We understand Liston's dangerous. The problem Stevenson is having right now is Stevenson isn't fighting people we consider to be dangerous. So it looks like Stevenson's just moving away, right? I believe he needs to follow the Dimitri Bevo playbook. Well, let me just say, the fourth round tells me, one man's opinion, that unbeaten Jaron Ennis would beat negative energy guys like Shakur Stevenson. He would smother Stevenson's speed. He would force Stevenson to back up and he would follow Stevenson. As Stevenson backs up, then he would drape himself on Stevenson in such a way that Stevenson, a defensive wizard, wouldn't be able to see the angles of the punches. So believe it or not, Avenesian comes back from that. We get the fifth rap. Avenesian is on his front foot. He backs up Jaron Ennis. Remember this moment. 
because it's the moment right before Ennis who is backing up, who is close to having his back up on the ropes. It's when Ennis gets the knockdown in the fight. Right, folks? It, you know, I had the over six and a half rounds. I saw enough from Avenesian where I thought in the middle of the fifth round. I thought, great, this bet's going to cash. Right? Sure, his face was swollen, but he's in the fight. Right? He's in the fight. Also, an eye wasn't closed yet. Right? Ennis understood that he had to back away from Avenesian at moments. Right? Ennis also had started the fight quickly where you thought Ennis had a lead. You thought Ennis was going to take time off, pace himself, let this fight linger a little bit. He's not in danger of losing on the scorecards. Instead, Ennis drops it. Right then, of course, after the round ends, of course, we find out from the ring doctor, and I don't understand this, but I don't know what was said. I don't know whether Avenesian said, hey, I can't breathe. Um, I don't know whether a cornerman said, hey, he has a broken rib. I don't know what was said, but I was surprised the fight got stopped. Maybe it's just sour grapes on my part. But Boots looks spectacular. Right? He looks spectacular. Let me just say um, two. And I thought it was interesting. I mentioned the ref earlier. The ref's running a tight ship here. So Boots gets on a roll. I believe it's in the fourth round. He tries to use his elbow. This is how advanced Boots is. He tries to use his elbow to frame Avenesia. Right? He is not even sticking out a hand. He's trying to have the elbow keep Avenician in place so he could throw other shots. Now this is Philly. The ref caught it. The ref, pay attention to the ref in this fight because it's a masterful job. The ref basically says to him, hey, cut that out. And Boots, here's the ref. He's skilled enough not to complain. Right? You haven't heard Boots complaining about the referee even though the ref reels him in. Right? Contrast and compare Tyson Fury against Deontay Wilder, the rematch, where Fury is blatantly measuring Wilder. Sticks his hand out just to kind of know the spacing between the two of them. He needs to be out of the way of Wilder's right hand. And he's just trying to figure out exactly when he can throw punches and the distance. Here, Boots tries to do that. But player, this is not the UK or Riyadh. That doesn't fly in Philly. The ref lets him know, hey, but just understand, Boots is in such control of the fight that Boots actually tries to use his hands as a rangefinder in a fight where his best shots are body shots. So where does that leave us? Folks, Boots, and I know he just signed a big deal with Matchroom. He only has one or two more punches at 147. Because Errol Spence has left the division, because Terrence Crawford has left the division, there is no, because Ryan Garcia is suspended, uh, because Connor Ben is not on this level. Right? Boots really has no one to fight at 147. Now, he gave an interview where he has plans to be king in at least four weight classes. Expect him to get to 154 sooner rather than later. Right? Let me just say, too, the fighters we have grown to love, right? Errol Spence, Terrence Crawford, Jamel Charlo, they're all in their 30s, right? Boots, 
a guy who has the ability to drape himself on you, who has clearly studied film. He studied film. I mean, this really is the Terence Crawford fight against Avenistian, right? He clearly has studied Errol Spence, right? Understand, Boots now has the ability to linger at 147 for another six months to a year. Wait for things to shake out a little bit at 154. Then he's going to show up at 154. I believe the guy who gives him the most trouble at 154, and this is early, my opinion might change, but I try to keep a ledger in my head like many people so that when a fight's announced, I can, I can grab the early odds if they're favorable to me before the public readjusts the line. Right? The guy who gives Boots a problem at 154, I believe, is Virgil Ortiz. Right? Ortiz has the power jab himself. Right? Understand, too, Ortiz, like Boots, has an extremely high KO ratio. The easy play on that fight is to take the prop that the fight doesn't go the distance. Errol Spence got jabbed to death early by Terence Crawford. I'm telling you that Boots is a film study guy. You look at the first round here, Boots is ambidextrous. You look at the first round here, you see the stiffness of Boots' jab, and you realize Errol Spence has no chance against him. Right, Sebastian Fundora, I'll just say Boots can be a sniper. Fundora is tall, much taller than Boots, right? I don't know how a guy with this body attack that Boots just threw down on Avenician, um, who's able to be close to you without getting hit, I don't know how Fundora would be able to survive Boots if Ennis comes in and targets Fundora's body like he targeted Avenician's body. Right, so let's just say you're looking at a talent here with a long runway, right? He's going to leave 147 unbeaten. Understand, too, Eddie Hearn has a contract with Conor Ben. That boots Conor Ben fight has a real chance of happening. They're both with Eddie Hearn, right? There shouldn't be the negotiating problems that you have with rival promoters, right? I believe Boots is going to leave 147 after one, two, two more fights tops. Then I believe boxing is going to have to come to Philadelphia. Right? Boots got a great crowd. A great crowd for this fight. Right? Someone like Virgil Ortiz doesn't have the home base that Boots Ennis has. Right? I think you're going to have fighters coming to him. Let's just say, keep an eye on this guy. He has a distinct age advantage on the old guard, right? Hall of Famers. Spence, Crawford, Charlo, they're all going to be Hall of Famers. But understand, boxing's a young man's game. Here you have a guy who's several years younger, who is a closer, who at 5'10", against a shorter opponent, can still target the guy's body and who has more skills than you realize, right? That jab is one of the better jabs in boxing, right? Hamza Shiraz, uh, Virgil Ortiz. I mean, this jab is really on par with those jabs. But yet it wasn't even the punch of the fight. I would say it's the right to the body that Ennis was thrown. Right? So I expect Ennis to try to mow down 154. Like Canelo mowed down 168. Right? It's going to be a moment in time. Let's keep an eye on this situation. Right? Let me say this. Where things start to get tricky is at 160, if Ennis is serious about just going through the weight classes. 
right? Because I've mentioned 160 has some boogeyman. Let me close by just mentioning Janabek here. You need to be concerned about his ability to stay at 160. Here's a guy looking for a big opportunity. He had an interesting fight coming up against an unbeaten fighter. And we're hearing that at that moment, he's dehydrated. That tells me that Janabek was walking around higher than 160, tried to cut weight to make the fight against a guy who has a bunch of knockouts and who would test him deep in the pocket, right? Would be draped on Janabek. If Mikhailovich had his way, and you're telling me Janabek couldn't go forward with that fight, and keep in mind, the card's still going forward. The Tevin farmer Moratella fight still going forward. The card's going forward without John Abeck. And you're telling me that the reason for the cancellation was because of dehydration. Pay close attention to that situation because the world's different at 168, folks. Right? At 168, you're suddenly talking about Morel, Canelo, Possibly Benavides. Now that Benavides fought his former sparring partner Groves Dick and realized that he couldn't stop Groves Dick. Right? A guy who was stopped by Perturbiev. Right? So pay close attention. You might have some guys growing out of their divisions in the next six months. Those are my thoughts. Let me hear yours in the comment section of this YouTube video. Thanks for stopping by.